All right, I am super excited for this. Uh, I have somebody that I have admired and respected uh, for years. Uh, she's a best-selling author. She's a uh, world-renowned keynote speaker. She's a TV personality, the president of Amber Mac Media. Amber Mac, hey. you're here. I, I feel the same way because I'm in your space. I know this isn't the space you use all the time, but I've been watching your content for a long time, so it's a real honor to be here as well. Well, you know what? I, you know, the, the, the funny story is, is that I, the reason why we're here in Toronto, in Mississauga, is because I was at a speaking event. I couldn't get back to Edmonton in time for all the other events that we had, so I had to bring the crew down. And I said, you know, who is the one person that I would want to, uh, you know, just sit down, do an interview, take advantage of the fact that I'm here, and it was you. And I thought that, uh, you yeah, know, we could just have a really open, fluid conversation about, you know, what's happening in the world. And I, feel, I think we share an interest around content and, and trust and a whole bunch of other topics. So I'm just excited to sort of dive into some of these things with you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's lots of overlap with our content. And people may assume, well, why would you ever want to meet? Because you guys are competing for events. But I don't feel that way at all. I mean, I've learned so much from watching you speak. And uh, I think we're both pushing boundaries in this space in totally. terms of virtual events and being able to deliver a different experience experience digitally so it's good to be able to come together and uh, chat about uh, everything that's happening which is kind of non-stop let's be honest <laughs> well you, you, you know actually uh, you, you know the one of the agencies that represents us speaker spotlight they actually I was talking to uh, one of the agents Marnie and she said you know there's there's people teaming up now for events and she's like who would you team up with and I'm like I would love to team up with Amber because I think both of our messages align and just like doing a tag team. We could go on the road. I love it. Drake and Future or something. <laughs> I don't know what it would, you know what I mean? Um, no, you know, one of the things I think that we have an interest in is this idea of content and production value. And I think many people would watch your content or my content and be like, what are these maniacs doing? producing these virtual events with so much production. Why would they do that? Now, can you explain in your world and in your, your mind, why would you put so much emphasis on production when you could just sit in your room looking like a hostage video? <laughs> I think you got to answer that question with the last part yeah. of it. But nonetheless, I think you're right. I think all of us are really just looking for that competitive advantage. I've sort of felt that way my entire life working in the technology space, especially as a woman. I always had to go above and beyond. And I feel the same way about virtual events. I don't want to just show up uh, on a web camera shooting up my nose with bad lighting. I want to make sure that it's the best experience possible. And thankfully, we've been able to really uh, push the boundaries with our content. So for me, it just feels like, I don't want to leave anything on the table. I want to be able to put all of our efforts into producing something that is the best in class and uh, push the boundaries of what's possible. You know, totally. some people are comfortable just doing the same thing over and over again, and that's fine. And uh, I think that you just in this digital world, you need to be able to really almost reinvent yourself on a weekly basis yeah. and, and really see what is possible out there. But why do you think production value matters? Like, why do you think uh, it's important to invest in actually elevating your voice, elevating the aesthetic, the design? Why do you think that's important? I think the reason that everyone should be investing in, in all of this different type of production equipment, whether it's doing virtual meetings or events, is honestly because it builds trust. You know, yes. I'm thinking back during the pandemic of that very famous uh, cat video where the lawyer couldn't get the cat yes. filter off of his head. And what happened in the first few minutes of that video? He lost trust. I mean, he might have been the best lawyer in the world. But what happens when all of a sudden, you know, you're not able to properly present yourself in the best light? Uh, no pun intended, yes. is that you lose the trust of your audience. And I think at the end of the day, trust has become so unbelievably important in this day and age. And if you can use production facilities and equipment to be able to build trust, I mean, that, again, gives you an opportunity to really connect in the virtual space. So I think it's essential, not just for us as professionals speaking, but really for everyday people who are going to continue potentially to and, work and, remotely. And to be honest with you, this is why I get really confused, because I see really, like, really established CEOs. CEOs and executives, and they still look like they're in a hostage video, which makes no sense. I'm like, uh, you know, at least if you showed up with a little bit more effort, 
perhaps the, the, the message would translate more. And this is my whole thing is that the, I think the reason why we put so much effort into the production is because at the end of the day, you could, an audience member, somebody watching it online, they're going to be tuned in just a little bit more. Now, I haven't proven statistically how into the content they would be a little bit more if we put production value behind it, but I just have this inkling that they are, and I'm confused as to why more executives haven't done it. Well, I, I think at the end of the day, maybe they just don't think it's as important as perhaps we do. But I think over time, what we're starting to see is that people are, in fact, actually increasing their production value, even for things like company meetings. And they realize they have to start to in invest in some of that equipment. So I think that they don't necessarily connect the dots and think that this virtual way of speaking or doing meetings is going to be here forever. It's sort of uh, almost like a, a bridging the gap, right? And they think maybe they're going to go back to face to face. Uh, I am not one of those people who necessarily believes that that's in our future. I think hybrid is going to be a reality for many individuals as well as businesses. Okay, let, let, let's get into that for a second uh, because maybe this is a, a bit, uh, I guess, counterintuitive or contrarian to what you're saying, but I believe that, you know, part of the magic of whether it's innovation or events, it's getting people together. It's having those collisions um, and when you're doing it remotely, it's kind of difficult to, I guess, connect on a more intimate level, develop that trust in relationships, and to create more serendipity, more luck. Um, I, do you agree with that? Well, I, I guess if you ask yourself that same question, uh, for whom is it better? <laughs> so it's better potentially for maybe some of the attendees who need to get away and want to have a, a golf weekend. Um, but I think at the end of the day, when we talk about actually physically being face-to-face -face, uh, at events together, one of the things that is a big concern to me uh, is flying all the yeah. time. You know, pre-pandemic, I was flying every week, if not twice a week, and I worry about the impact on the planet. And so so I'm definitely stepping back from uh, being that frequent flyer and being out there. And I believe that we can do something in the virtual space that maybe isn't the same as face to face, uh, but we are sharing knowledge. And, and I would go one step further. I think we assume that conferences are always the best experience possible. You know, think about sitting in the back row of a ballroom. And think about all the distractions around you and think about how maybe hungover you might be from the night before. Uh, think about your friend talking to you beside you. I, I don't assume that conferences are the best learning environment. And I am in the business, as you are, of basically sharing knowledge and helping people learn. And I think online, uh, I think at least for me, I can do that even better. Well, let, let, let me just... Uh let the audience know that you actually made a massive move. Like something that is, uh, you, you, you published this, that you are no longer going to travel. I mean, obviously you have, you have some uh, contracted engagements that you have to fulfill, but over the next year and potentially beyond that you're, you're going to stick to virtual, which is, unbelievable and it shows leadership and it's admirable and uh you know what 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 made you make that decision that's incredible well, I, I think um, at the end of the day, I think that um, after just contrasting what my life is like when I am traveling all the time to events versus doing virtual events uh, here home in Toronto, I had to really take into account a number of different factors. Uh, one of them, of course, is the environment. I don't want to be flying every week. It's Absolutely. not to say I'm not going to fly anymore. Um, I'll fly to visit my family, right. maybe, you know, family trips, whatever. Uh, but I don't need to be contributing to, uh, you know, thousands of people flying across the country to speak at an event. Uh, so one is the environment. Uh, the second um, is, is quite frankly, just uh, a financial decision because I can do a lot more events yeah, yeah. in my virtual studio than I can ever do when I'm traveling. And guess what happens when you travel for a one hour keynote uh, across the continent? You're exhausted. Totally. So all of a sudden I've gone from being productive for one hour and unproductive for 72 hours um, in that face-to-face -face environment when I could be doing more in the virtual space. And I think third, uh, also for my family, you know, my son is 12 years old and I'm excited to spend more time with him. I was listening to a woman speak re recently about spending more time with her kids and she said she felt more confident as a mother now than ever mm. because she was present and she was home. And for me, it feels like 
I've experienced that as well. And um, I don't need to be doing all this traveling. I can totally. still, uh, again, deliver that same sense of knowledge. So lots of people will love face-to-face -face and, uh, and will continue. Well, you know, I, I feel almost as guilt because... I, I love virtual. I mean, we, we, you know, we, we have this setup that, you know, we've, we've created this own, our own metaverse that we've created, <laughs> really. And I love it, but I also love the face-to-face. -face. I love seeing people. I love getting in front of an audience uh, because I do rely on, you know, things like humor and I like to see what works. Like, and you're right, though, financially, it does make an impact. Uh, in a negative way because like you could be doing way more virtual like for example I had to go to Washington I couldn't get back to Edmonton in time I'd literally have to fly people out here to, to, to Toronto to do a keynote I mean it financially it, it you know it, it almost doesn't make sense because I should just doing this I should be doing it virtually so I, I but I feel this guilt because I should be thinking about the climate but it you know what it, it, it it's made me think that um, I should be much more concerned. And this is the first time that I was like, I should be much more concerned about my carbon footprint. And um, uh, yeah, it, it, I think it, it, it took the industry by pause. Well, and, and I think too, you know, you assume that, okay, so the carbon footprint of one person, me not flying to events is not going to make a huge difference. But in the events industry at large, if you think about the impact of hundreds or thousands of people going to a hotel, going to an event for three days, again, there is that impact as well. So to me, it's just a question of uh, what part of the future of events do you want to lead in? And for me, I think virtual and digital is a much better place, both uh, ethically and economically economically to be and that's not going to be the same for everyone you know yeah. like let's be honest I have this great studio in Toronto my husband does all of our production life is easy I walk 10 minutes to my house I mean it's a really sweet setup and I haven't had that for 13 years I've been a road warrior and I've missed my family so there yeah. are many factors that just make that the right decision for me yeah you know um I, I think this leads to a, a really interesting conversation. You know, there, there's a narrative right now. You've been, you might have been hearing it about the great resignation. Great resignation. More and more people are leaving their traditional work and they're looking for more pleasurable or stable work or just like burning the bridges together, like all together. I think I saw a study by Oracle that said 88% um, of people that have redefined what success means to them, 83% are considering a career change. Uh, McKinsey study recently, 64% of people are willing to take another job with no secondary job, like just like willing to burn the bridges. Uh, and what does it like, in terms of the great resignation, I don't know if you've been following this, I, I guess what's your take on what's happening and is this the great resignation or maybe it's like how we just look at work fundamentally uh, and it probably has to change. Well, I've read lots of reports that have said recently that maybe resignation is the wrong word to be using because a lot of people are just reprioritizing what they want to be doing. And so there's a lot of turmoil and shifting that's happening in the industry. And so I think if you think about what the past 18 months or so has done to a lot of people is that maybe you've had some time alone to really think totally. about what you want to be doing. Maybe you don't like your job. Maybe you're forced into working virtual and that's just not for you. You need to shift to another job. Maybe your boss wants you to come back into the office and you have little kids and that's not going to work for you. So I think all of a sudden for the first time in history, we've really, uh, I shouldn't say history, but our lives, we've had a sense of a pause mm. that has taken place. And when you have that pause, I think people are able to really reevaluate their lives and say, what's important to me? Where do I want to be? What do I want to be doing? So I think it's more about reprioritizing than perhaps uh, resigning from your job. That's just maybe one of the tactics that's involved in your long-term strategy. And what would you say to leaders that are grappling with this now? Like you have more and more people that are saying, listen, I'm fed up. Like I'm stressed out, I'm burned out, and, and I'm fed up with um, how I'm being treated. And wh what do you think uh, the bat signal is to leaders and you know, how they have to go off and change? Well, it's really interesting that you ask that because one of the things that I did in my keynotes after about six months of doing virtual keynotes is I added a section in my keynote called wellness uh, tech. Mm -hmm. And I was focused on wellness being a trend that's happening in the digital space and something that we need to really look at and prioritize. And I kind of threw it in there, like you probably do as sort of a test. Is this going to actually resonate or land with anyone? And then people wanted more in that section. And so I built out that section to talk about the future of work and wellness. And it was really 
interesting to me, albeit uh, a little frightening, how many people are suffering, whether it's mental or physical health? You know, um, there's a bunch of stats from companies like Working Den that have said that uh, more than 50% of people right now are experiencing anxiety working from home on a regular basis, many people with physical pain. I mean, what impact does that have on the future of work? And so I look at that and I think as a leader, all of a sudden, you're not only in charge of your business outcomes, you're also in charge as far as the health and wellness of your teams. And that's a new responsibility Mm. for leaders. And you have to ask that question, how are you able to make sure that your team is well in an environment that may be virtual and into the future? So I think leaders have had to take on this new role that maybe, um, again, they're not prepared for, but they certainly need to be prepared for this in the future because I don't think there's any turning back from this. Totally. We almost need like a chief wellness officer or uh, maybe the, 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 the role of the, the, uh, the, the human resources leader is going to expand into, into the space. I mean, it's... It really is. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, I was reading in a, a Forbes article a little uh, while ago where one of the authors had said in an article that um, if the pandemic was all about uh, being sick and fighting being sick, then uh, the future of work is all about a sense of wellness. And so the idea is we take people who have been fighting to, you know, not get COVID during these really difficult times and we make sure that they're safe. But it's not just that. We go above and beyond yeah. to make sure that they are healthy and well in the future. And now that's your job, totally. <laughs> right? And and that, again, is a huge responsibility beyond really anything else at the end of the day. So if you take this conversation and apply it to, for example, uh, children and, and, and maybe your son, uh, obviously, you know, during the pandemic, he had to do online schooling. I'm sure that was an impact on on his sort of mental health and and. Um, I'm just curious, how did he sort of navigate, you know, online learning and not seeing his buddies and it was really hard. So I have to say at the beginning of the pandemic, when school went virtual, I was one of those people like, hey, let's get the best virtual tools. This is going to be great. Yeah, yeah. These kids can do that. And then after three months, I was like, send them back to school. They need to be in person. <laughs> this is not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Virtual learning is not working for them. And so I, it was interesting. My son was at first kind of excited about the the newness of it all. You know, he could stay home and he could learn online, play a little video game games in between. But then over the months, I started to recognize how important it was for him to be back in the classroom yeah. with his friends. I mean, you have kids. They yeah. need to be with other kids. Those are their peers. Totally. And and those people define how you represent yourself in the community, right? You know, he is so much himself, but he's also the group of people he hangs out with as far as his peers, and he sort of defines himself in that group. And when you lose that, I think you get with a lot of kids the sense of sadness. So there were days when I walked in, you know, after months of online learning, you know, he looked like that really sad, depressed Mm. kid, and that was heartbreaking as a parent, as someone who loves technology. Like, this was one thing that technology could not solve. Totally. I want to ask you a question. Does Does your son game? Yes, he does. I'm actually really, I'm nervous. I'm nervous about gaming. My, my kids are younger. I have a five-year-old and I have a two-year-old. And my nieces and nephews are all sort of in the, you know, the 10 to 12, sort of 13 range. And I get nervous as a parent. And I'm a, I'm a technology guy. And I, I, I love digital and people embracing technology. But the the level of, I guess, inception that the Roblox and the Fortnite uh, have, it, it, it's on another level. And I'm, I'm just worried as a parent, is it too addictive? Well, I think it's a good question, and, and I've seen that with my son where um, when he started playing Is Fortnite. He into Roblo- he's into Fortnite? He was Ro- okay. into Roblox. He got into Fortnite. Um, Fortnite became very stressful for him. You know, it just became very overwhelming. And yet he's gone back to playing things like Minecraft, you know, which obviously is like a different type of game and being much more collaborative. So I think at the end of the day, it really depends on your child. I, I wrote a book uh, about uh, online safety for kids a few years ago. Uh, don't buy it because it's too old and it's totally irrelevant. <laughs> so this is definitely not 
not a plug I think for the book. You, it, I don't know if it was a predecessor to Fortnite and Roblox and, and, and it maybe was a, It was around the same time, okay. but you know, people come on these interviews and they plug their books. I'm saying do not buy any of my books. They're old after six months. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, but I, I do want to say that I think um, in that book, one of the things that I talked a lot about was how it really depends on your child, right? And, mm. and each individual child reacts differently to those environments of gaming, right? One, ki one of your kids may be okay with totally. gaming a lot, the other may not. The second is um, the context of their day. Have they gone and, you know, done a hockey tournament or, right. uh, you of know, course, whatever, yeah. you know, the context of the day. And, and the third really is the content. What game are they playing? Mm. And these are the questions we have to ask ourselves. Where are they spending time? You know, are they in, um, are they on Instagram all day and it's, you know, affecting their self-esteem? I know that's not a video game, but still, what are they doing with their time? What content are they doing? And so when you focus on some of those different things, you start to piece together what's right for your child. I don't think there's one really easy solution. And I know parents hate to say that because they want me to say one hour a day and that's all you get. But totally. it's just different for every kid and we have to accept that. So you're not nervous that they're spending way too much time gaming. And, and, and maybe this is a, a debate that every generation has. My my kid is watching <laughs> way too much television. Oh my! Maybe it started with like, my kid is reading too many books and then my kid is watching too much television and then my kid is playing too much Nintendo and now it's like too much Fortnite. Maybe that narrative has been going on for generation and generation and me as a father, I'm like, okay, maybe this is, is this my video game? Yeah, and I love that you say that, but uh, you know, not that I'm not nervous about my son playing too many video games, but if you ask me what I'm nervous about him doing, I'm nervous about him crossing the road on Queen Street in downtown right, Toronto right. No, 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 because people yeah. don't care about uh, you know right. pedestrians anymore, driving, yeah. right? Our yeah. city has been overrun by cars. Uh, I'm nervous about other things much more so, I think, than video games. And I think at least, but again, I may have one of those kids where it has been a little bit more manageable with him. I've certainly seen those kids where they've become addicted to the games, and um, and then all of a sudden it becomes a huge issue. Um, however, I will say that most kids I think are happy to be back in school face-to-face. Yeah. -face. They're enjoying it for now. <laughs> so so let's, let's hope that lasts. So, you know, uh, Roblox and Fortnite are, they're not exactly the metaverse, but they have elements of the metaverse. And I'm sure, you know, you're, you're plugged into the tech ecosystem. You saw Facebook announce to the world that they're moving uh, they're not only changing their name to Meta, but they're changing the core to focus on the Metaverse um, over the next decade plus. Uh, what's your uh, initial thoughts about their move? I know you, you, you have been uh, somewhat critical of Facebook and around privacy, around misinformation. Uh, and so I'd love to get your take on sort of this move to the Metaverse. Is it just a distraction to, to some of the challenges that they've been having? Well, I think if I ran Facebook today, which of course includes Instagram, um, I would also want to move to the metaverse because of the impact <laughs> <laughs> that right. all of these tools have had on society. Now, I say this not from uh, being someone who uh, was always critical of these platforms. I've used them. They're, they're great for business. I understand their role in our society. But I think at the end of the day, when you see all of a sudden these platforms become a threat to democracy, uh, hurting our kids, uh, an invasion of privacy, all of these issues are really concerning. And so to go back to your question about the metaverse, uh, I think absolutely Mark Zuckerberg wants to build the metaverse. It's it's going to be a much easier path than him for him than to fix Facebook and Instagram, right? Right. And so it makes sense to me that he made that turn and he wants to go in that direction. However, at the same time, I would say what happens to the millions of people who are using Facebook and Instagram, who are impacted by it, who are following algorithms that are making them feel badly about themselves, especially young girls, what happens to them? You know, why are, why isn't all of his attention focusing on fixing that? Is it because it's unfixable? And if that's the case, what happens to Facebook and Instagram over so, the years to come? You know, I and this is a very unpopular opinion, but I find that the narrative around Facebook is really negative. Yet when I ask people, are you using Facebook on a date? Like the Facebook product, I'm not talking about Instagram. We could leave Instagram for most people that I know are not really using Instagram. My mom, I mean, Facebook, my mom is using Facebook and she actually uses it. I think it's been a positive thing. Like she's, she's a very small community of people. They're all like 70 plus and they all share their pictures. And I think it's been amazing. She's always thinking about like, what can I post on Insta uh, Facebook? And oh, this person's doing that. I, I think it's like, it goes back to Facebook in like 2006 when that's what it was for, for your friends, not about the, the news. 
And I feel like the narrative around Facebook has been around misinformation. Uh, and I, I just, I, I sometimes feel like how many people are, are actually uh, affected by their algorithm? Like, I feel like the noise is really big, but in actuality, the, the results are very small. And I feel like things like Twitter are way more toxic than like Instagram or Facebook. I mean, TikTok's algorithm is just, insane. I just feel like there's other platforms that are probably even more, uh, uh, I guess, uh, they're worse, yet Facebook gets all the blame. Okay, so I don't think that Facebook would have been our focus of this conversation if it hadn't been the pandemic. So if you look at mm. what's happened with Facebook and the pandemic is they've been a number one news source for misinformation and disinformation about vaccines. So the effects are actually massive on the number of people who then choose not to get vaccinated because some garbage they read on Facebook that is untrue and unfactual. What do the Facebook algorithms do? Well, we know that it has been in research papers that some of the top articles that are shared on Facebook to billions of users every mm. single month tend to be those articles that have um, untrue information about the vaccines or even COVID-19. They rise to the top. So the algorithms do affect us on Facebook in a different way. So it's a societal impact that even though you and I are not on Facebook every single day, there are certainly communities of people who are. And it has led to the rise in the number of people who believe in COVID misinformation, right. um, who then decide not to get vaccinated. And at the end of the day, that leads down a very dark road to potential death. And so right. I don't mean to be dramatic. No, about no, all no, this, no. It's but it's a reality that we're in right now is that it does have a, an effect on society. And I think the past 18 months have shown us that, yes, Facebook launches this place where we could all get together. My parents are in their 70s. They love Facebook. But for some communities of people, it reinforces information that is harmful to our society. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself, what role does Facebook play knowing that they're amplifying that content? Totally. And, and I think uh, you're right. And, and, and they, they have played a part in that. I, I don't know exactly. I haven't read those studies and how much they have. Uh, I just feel like, like any technology, to me, it's been 51% good and 49% bad. Now, with Facebook, perhaps it's been 51% bad, but to me, like the billions of dollars of, uh, just like the, the companies that were built on top of Facebook and Instagram, the amount of entrepreneurs, the amount of companies, uh, the amount of people that got married and connected, like I just can't, and I just go back to my mother, like without Facebook, I don't know how she'd be so connected with her friends, especially during the pandemic. And I also see a lot of people complaining about Facebook and they still use Instagram and WhatsApp all the time. So I, I always get like confused about that. Anyway, so so I wanna... just to ask you a question though, if you think about that, if you think that, yes, you're, I think you're absolutely right. There's been so many positives that have come out of Facebook, but at the same time, did Facebook have to build algorithms that amplified hate or misinformation or disinformation because they knew there would be more eyeballs on it? Or did they let it go like a snowball running down a hill where they didn't get it under control? So yes, we I, I love all the good stuff, but unfortunately I wish it didn't have to happen at the cost of people's totally. lives. And that's a question. I don't want to defend ask. Facebook, right? But I, 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 too much. I fire, I'm like Mark Zuckerberg right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get a job at Facebook afterwards. I just think that, you know, the scale at which Facebook has exploded, they become one of the most profitable companies of all time. And they're a baby. They just basically started. And to be, to, to, to scale to you know billions of people in a, such a short amount of time and look at how they've grown, I don't think any company can uh, can compare in terms of their so, sale and growth. And I, that doesn't mean that they're not that, that they sure. shouldn't be reprimanded for you know some of the things that they've done around mental health or misinformation. It's just like it's just kind of something that kind of grew out of control. And um, I believe that there should be some regulation. I just I just feel like you know. So let me slack. go back to your first question then. So knowing that Facebook has grown really quickly and there's challenges that have been really difficult to manage, and, and I totally agree with you, uh, knowing that, hey, there's been a lot of, of harm that has been done, is your first move when that gets out into the public? Metaverse. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no, I, 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 I see what you have to say around that, but I think, you know, it, I, I think what Mark Zuckerberg uh, is really good at is understanding where the future is going. And yes, there are a lot of issues and a lot of challenges. But I think 
Zuckerberg doesn't get enough credit for the acquisition of Instagram early, like a billion dollars for a company with had 12 people and with no revenue. I mean, it was absurd. I mean, I don't even know how Instagram is a value now, but it was one of the best acquisitions of all time. WhatsApp for 19 billion was an amazing acquisition. The, I think one of the misses that Zuckerberg always probably thinks about is that he was slow to mobile. Um, uh, when it really came out, they probably lost a couple of years in that in that space. And so when he sees the metaverse coming, he's like, I don't want to be left back again when this trend is on an exponential scale. And so is there a right time? Are they going to fix all the issues? Are they the narrative is not going to change around Facebook? So I think taking a bold step and saying, listen, we're going to change what we're doing. Uh, we're also going to look at privacy and how we um, handle misinformation in new ways. I, I think it's a bold, courageous step, and it might fix some of the problems. It probably create new problems too. <laughs> I, 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 I actually don't mind the move. I think it's a bold, courageous move, and um, yeah. See, I, I, and again, we're, I probably know too much and I'm too deep into the research that has recently been revealed from the Facebook whistleblower as one example. And I think my real issue with this is especially when we think about uh, not just anti-vaxxers, but about kids, right? Yeah. And, and there has been data that has been shown that, uh, you know, if a young girl is looking for uh, anorexia content um, because she, you know, is just searching Instagram, that she is fed more more and more of that content, which leads her down a path of self-harm. Mm. If I woke up in the morning and I was responsible for that, my last move would be metaverse. My first move would be, we're going to fix this. Yes, mm. I'm going to put this guy in charge or this woman in charge of metaverse, but I'm going to fix the problems that I've caused. And I'm going to wake up every day and make sure that this is a safe environment for everyone. And I think if that happens with more of these tech founders, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg is not alone. You know, Elon Musk is another person who, you know, again, goes off the rails at times. And, yeah. Um, drives me a little bit insane. If you want to talk about him, it's fine. But uh, nonetheless, when are our tech leaders going to be responsible for what they've built? And when are we going to have a new generation of leaders that build things in a way that it benefits society and they take accountability for any problems that they've caused well you've convinced me and I and I and I, I believe that you're right I, I believe that um, you know going back to that to that young girl and, and, and the algorithm feeding her more of this um, more of things that will essentially harm her I think that that definitely is a is, is a valid point I, you, you mentioned Elon and yet you also mentioned the fact that when are the tech leaders going to you know, kind of step up. Like Elon is working on the world's biggest problems. Energy, like transportation, uh, space. I mean, like he's tackling some big issues. So I'm just curious what, you, what your, <laughs> what your uh, uh, beef is with Elon. I feel like I should turn the camera and ask uh, the Elon bros not to come <laughs> not, after me. <laughs> by, the way, by the way, I'm not an Elon, I'm not an Elon bro at all. And um, I, 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 I'm just curious, I'm just curious. Well, okay, first of all, I don't think our biggest problem is not, uh, I don't think one of our biggest problems right now is that we can't go and uh, live on Mars or we can't space travel. 100%. Okay, so I don't think that's one of our biggest problems. Energy issues, 100%, right? I think that um, he is an incredible innovator and entrepreneur. Do I want uh, our leaders of tomorrow to be more responsible? Would I prefer that, you know, Elon Musk doesn't tweet out, you know, calling reputable people names and, you know, telling them they have tiny peepees? Do I think that's maybe uh, beneath the role that right. he plays that's in like our society. Trump, that's like a Trump-esque uh, move. Yes. So here's here's the thing that I probably want, and I'm sorry if this is if it makes me you know idealistic in my views of the future. I would love to see more responsible leaders of the biggest tech companies in the world do incredible things to solve real human problems. And I'm not saying Elon isn't, yeah. but at the end of the day, he's his own worst enemy when it comes to his personality, his bullying online. He starts, has these certain characteristics that we forgive. And I would argue mm. at time that we shouldn't forgive people who have such powerful roles. We should hold them to account. And I do not think he is the best role model out there, despite his incredible work tech bros. Uh, he's awesome. Despite his incredible work when it yeah. comes to transportation and energy. And so what would happen if Elon was put, you know, beyond transportation and energy on solving a problem like 
let's say violence against women. I realize that's not his space, but if that, you know, something he decided to solve and put money towards, imagine what he could do. Yeah. Uh, clean drinking water in indigenous communities. Imagine what he could do. I know he's doing well, a lot of sat satellite the, internet. There, so. there was a recently, uh, there was a tweet that said, uh, with $6 billion, you could solve world hunger. And I think Elon had tweeted out, all right, I'm, I'm willing to like sell my Tesla stock. Just give me a plan. And, you know, of course, there was no plan, right? I, 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 I agree with you. I think his personality is, is uh, uh, like many tech entrepreneurs, he's, he's a little bit awkward and weird, and he doesn't represent uh, probably what the best of our leaders should be. Like, you know, I'm a big Obama guy. Like, I love Obama. Like, to me, that's what a leader looks like and, and speaks uh, like and, and um, has values. Uh, so... I just think that with Elon, uh, don't you need sort of these renegades to try audacious innovations and go into industries that are archaic uh, and we will just, we'll just, you know, accept the fact that they're a little crazy, that they're, they're going to say some stuff online, that they're going to they're gonna do all this stuff. But at the same time, they're trying to do some incredible things in these industries. Uh, I, I think the answer, my answer to that question would be no. I, I don't think we have to accept that that is mm. the leader of tomorrow. I think that's why we need more women. We need oh, more yeah, diversity um, in these different roles. Uh, and again, uh, it's not to say that he hasn't done incredible things like Mark Zuckerberg has, but you just wonder if there was a different person in that role, what would be the impact um, on, on problems that we're trying to solve today? Would the impact be different? So I guess my point is, is that a lot of people worship these tech leaders who at the end of the day have caused some harm, who maybe Absolutely. aren't the uh, you know best examples of the, the top leaders in the world. And I don't think I have to go out there and defend them. I think I can be honest about my feelings about them. And you know I do remember things like Elon Musk uh, calling one of the divers who was trying to save those yeah, kids in that, Thailand a pedophile. Like yeah. these are things that I feel we've given these leaders permission to be a little bit you know, off center or a little bit eccentric. Um, but I'll tell you right now, if a woman were to assume that role and do those types of things, she would no longer 100%. be the head of that company. It, 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 it is the, um, I don't know, I, I'm not educated in this uh, topic of white privilege, but I'm sure there's um, some of that in there uh, with Elon and, and he gets away with a lot more because of that. And I think one of the things that excites me, again, if we want to be more positive about the future, at least of the technology and digital industry, is that we are starting to see different types of leaders really step up and build companies that may not be, you know, to the extent of what Elon Musk has built or Mark Zuckerberg. But I do believe that our kids and that generation of kids yeah. will build much different businesses. And that excites me. And I want to open doors so that they are empowered to do just that. Totally. Because I do think that that will, that will present a new world. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said it's been a chaotic time. You know, all these guys are launching these companies and it's moving quickly and it's, you know, it's, it's off the charts as far as how they build up this massive user base, you know, in, in Facebook's uh, case, billions of users, you know, it's taken what, you know, less than 20 years, right? But now we have a bit of foundation in the tech industry to build something better for tomorrow. Absolutely. And I think that's going to be super exciting. So um, I, I, I don't know what your position is on you know, Web3, blockchain, like NFTs. I haven't seen you, you know, talk too much of that. What's your take on sort of what's happening in that sort of bubble? Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I've definitely stayed away a little bit from talking why? about yeah, blockchain why, why is technology that? Um, as well as uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, again, uh, I, I probably am more interested in... Uh, tangible things right now. <laughs> and, and not saying that cryptocurrency no, 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 isn't tangible, um, but I do believe that there are experts in that space who do a great job of being able to go down this path of talking about cryptocurrency and, and all of the benefits of cryptocurrency. Um, one of the things that I really want to do in my life right now is to focus on uh, planet first uh, solutions. I want to work with clients that are focusing on solving yeah. climate problems. Uh, is cryptocurrency something that I would uh, dive into? Uh, probably not knowing that mining crypto, again, is not great for the environment and not to sound like a broken record. And it just, at the end of the day, these are things that maybe just don't excite me that much when it comes to all the different types of technology. AI, healthcare, those totally. type of things. I do talk a lot about that because it feels sort of real and tangible and it can affect and help the everyday person. 
You know, I, I, I felt the same way about blockchain. I, I never used to talk about it. Uh, but once I got into the Web3 rabbit hole, I can't get out. To me, it's the most interesting thing happening on the internet today. And I am just, uh, I'm fascinated, I'm immersed, I, I see its potential. I, I can't stop thinking and talking about it. It's just, it's a, it's a disease. So, what, so tell me why, what, what excites um, you about it? To, to me, it's the idea of ownership at the end of the day. I think what Web3 is really all about, it's we're moving from the attention economy, which was Web2, uh, where we traded our data and our attention for like, you know, and we gave our likes and our hearts to these tech companies that accumulated great wealth. And we're moving to this new internet, which is all about the users being able to own their sort of piece of the world, their own piece of the internet. And if you see what's happening, for example, in the NFT space where creators can now sort of um, own their own data, own their own customers, uh, uh, to me, that's really exciting. And it's not about these big tech companies making you know, billions of dollars, it's actually uh, giving uh, the resources and money back to the creators. Uh, to me, that's probably the most exciting part of it and the fact that we're moving into that ownership economy. What are the, some of the issues that we're having in the world today around a data, what are you doing with my data? And the fact that you can sort of own your own data, to me, that, that is really interesting. And of course, at, because everything is sort of registered on the blockchain, um, that is what sort of obviously, uh, uh, you know, shows authenticity and, 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 and or, you know, the fact that it's original. Um, there's so many pieces of, about it that are just, they're just captivating. Yeah, I mean, especially I think in the music industry, I, I interviewed uh, Rain Maida recently. Yeah, okay. And uh, in the music industry, I think it's fascinating to your point of, you know, imagine being able to own a song. And I think all of those things are incredibly exciting uh, and beneficial. And I think for me, it's almost like, I'm not saying stay in your lane, because I certainly haven't done that over my career. But I, I am saying that, you know, you kind of know this, the space that you're in, right? And I've been focusing a lot over the past couple of years on automation, artificial intelligence. Those have been topics I've tried to really educate myself uh, more on. And I think with, um, with blockchain I, I, and cryptocurrency, those are the topics, again, I think there's great speakers and experts on that, and I just don't touch them no, as much. I, I I agree, and I, I, I also don't want to be, uh, I, I agree, you should definitely stay in the, your, as a practitioner in your field. Um, and I'm not, a, I don't think anybody's a really a practitioner in Web3 yet, uh, but I, I can't wait to be starting more projects and getting involved in the ecosystem um, a lot more. And I just, I see it, it I see it coming. And, I don't know, I'm just, I, I, I feel like it, it, maybe, and I also am in a bubble. Because 99% of the people that I talk to, <laughs> yeah. they have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. I, I was with a whole bunch of banking executives yesterday. That, they have no idea about this, right? Um, so I also have to recognize my audience. And, and then I never talked about blockchain before because I was like, it was never going to hit. Like, it's gonna, it was going to take 10 years to hit. But now I feel like something is happening. Yeah. And I think you're right. And I think, I, and I hate that I feel this way. I wish that I had the optimism <laughs> that I had in my 20s. But there's this little voice in the yeah. back of my head that's saying, does cryptocurrency and blockchain um, matter if we have no planet to enjoy, uh, do these things matter if everybody is sick and unwell? And I do have that that sort of narrative running in my head all the time, and I wish that wasn't the case. Yeah. I wish that I could stop that pesky little voice, which is saying, hey, like we're in a crisis, a health crisis, we're in a climate crisis, all these things. So I'm trying to sort of basically turn my career so I'm less like, hey, here's a cool new phone, and here's a great pair of yeah. headphones. You can just, I'm trying to turn my career to the point where I'm thinking, what technology solutions can can solve big problems. And I guess with NFTs uh, and, and, and blockchain uh, and crypto, um, it seems like, you know, maybe a footnote uh, in a bigger book for me at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait till it's the entire, it's an entire chapter <laughs> for you. Um, you got to no, help me with it. I know, no, I know, I know, stuff. I know. I'm going to start sending you stuff and you're going to get in the rabbit <laughs> hole and then you're, you're never going to get out of it. Uh, no, no, no. Th th this is great. You know, I, you know, part of the reason why I want to uh, have you here is because I think uh, you have seen everything in the in the sort of the internet era, and from Web One when it was decentralized, uh, I think you really made a name for yourself, sort of 
in the internet age. You were the first sort of, uh, I, I know in Canada, one of the first entrepreneurs to really talk about the, the internet in compelling ways and, and, and to, to show executives and leaders what the internet was all about and, and then social and, and now artificial intelligence. Like you've always been on the sort of the cutting edge of what's happening. And I guess just seeing all the waves of technology come uh, uh, through, like, what have you learned about how people have adopted and um, how people have implemented some of these technologies uh, for, for, for good? Well, I think generally speaking, I've been uh, optimistic over the years about how technology has been implemented for good and how it can help people in their lives. And so I've never been one of those people, especially with kids who I say, don't give your kids any technology. I've seen the benefits that it can uh, lead to in children's lives. I see the benefits in seniors' lives. I see the benefits for people who have accessibility issues or disabilities. I mean, it's incredible to see what technology can bring to um, people of all walks of life. So that has been the most exciting part of my career over time is being able to understand sort of that the magic of technology in our society and, and I try to return to that magic oftentimes when I speak at events to say hey don't forget you know for someone who's hard of hearing you know a hearing aid means they can hear their little granddaughter laugh for the first time I mean that brings tears to my eyes and that is a wonderful thing and that's technology yeah not all technology is bad there's lots of good tech in the world so that has always excited me and I think the second thing I've learned and, and I'm sure you've come across this before maybe your experience seeing it right now with uh, NFTs is that uh, sometimes things we get excited about, uh, it's just too early for that technology. Uh, podcasting is a great example. Totally. I've been doing podcasting for more than a decade, but all of a sudden, like... Everyone has a podcast. Everyone has a podcast, right? Yeah. It's been around for a long time, but it was just too early. And so I think it's interesting to see how things really have that tipping point in our society totally. with technology. And I'm excited to see in the future what some of these things that you're talking about and I talk about, when they sort of tip and they become more mainstream for everybody. Yeah, totally. Well, Amber, you know, I think the reason why people love you is because you're authentic, you're real, you're down to earth, but also you have an incredible amount of integrity. You, you, you're not afraid to say what you feel. And I, I wish I had that a little bit more because I think you are incredibly, like you, you, you don't, you, you will dive into the vaccine debate. You will dive into politics. You will uh, signal to the world like, no, I'm not, I'm not traveling this year because you know, I, these are the things that I care about. Um, where do you get that audacity to do that? Is it because you have built brand equity? Like, I, I, I just, I wish I could do that a little bit more. Help me. <laughs> That's the last question I have. Like, how, how can I do that a little bit more? You know, I think that you, you earn that or you learn that over time because I think early on in my career, I didn't really speak up a lot. And I think I had jobs like many people did where, you know, if you talked a lot, you know, I had one boss in San Francisco at a tech company. He used to call me Chatty Cathy because I always had a solution for every problem, yeah. right? And they sort of demean you in that way. And I think time comes and experience comes uh, with being able to step up and mm. be able to stand up for yourself and defend other people. And um, I'm also a little bit concerned right now about the lack of voices and people who feel comfortable sort of defending the defenseless right now. And so I think I've been able to just really be more open. And I, I don't think it's something that I came to naturally. <laughs> I think it's just, you know, after 20 years of experience, you just sort of get more comfortable with this idea that I have a voice and I now know what I believe in and what I care about. And that may be different than other people. I can still respect them. I'm not going to, you know, call them names and tell them they have a little pee pee. I'm going to engage totally. in sensible conversation. Just don't you know, take that clip out of reference. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, I think it's incredibly admirable and uh, um, admirable. And, you know, I look at, for example, Dave Chappelle, and I'm not talking about the fact that he got canceled. And, you know, I, I think I, I, I'm not asking you to weigh in on that and, and what he said in his special. His special was terrible. Uh, but one of the things I respect about Dave Chappelle is that he doesn't give a F. Like he just he says what he's, he, he feels and he just and he doesn't care about the repercussions. And you have a little bit of that, too, in the sense that you're willing to put it all out there. And I love that. I, I think that's, you know, you're, you're, you're just 
you're showing who you are. I think it's amazing. Yeah, and I, I think there's an important uh, difference there is that, you know, some people choose to punch up and some people choose to right. punch down. And, you know, when I talk about technology leaders or politicians in a way where I'm critical of what they do, I'm punching up. Um, I certainly would never punch down on the trans community because totally. I think that would be something, um, again, that that community doesn't deserve, and, nor would I uh, participate uh, in doing so because there are plenty of problems and plenty of people when you punch up that you can find along the way. Totally. Well, Amber, I, uh, I really appreciate you being here, uh, you know, in our makeshift theater that we've created just for like a couple hours. And uh, it was just an honor and a pleasure for us to just chat and, uh, and, and for you to be here, really. It was a true pl pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And you are awesome. I'm so glad we get to actually connect and see each other in person after uh, following each other I online know. for so long. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Appreciate it.